Well, a very good morning, everybody, and welcome to church today. Whether you're here in the sanctuary with us in person, maybe we are a little lighter loaded than usual due to the school holidays, um, or maybe it's because it's low Sunday and everyone's doing something else. So, as, as I joked this morning, we may be low on staff and uh, low on numbers, uh, but I'm sure we will not be low in spirit. Anyway, you're very welcome, and regardless of where and uh, when you're joining us, if you're joining us online, I hope you have a sense of God's presence as we worship God together today. An extra special welcome to you if you're visiting or if you're new here. Um, We worship in the Reformed tradition, which more or less means that we only stand up to sing and when it's time to go for coffee and biscuits at the end. Um, You can do that by wandering through those doors that way and following everyone else. Other than that, the service will more or less run unannounced this morning, so do follow the order of service that you should have been given as you arrived. As I said, and you may have noticed, Sandy is not around this week. Nothing to worry about. He's on annual leave and will be returning to work this Friday. Um, And Sandy is not the only one on holiday this week. Bettina and Pauline are also away, as indeed is Kate the organist, so we welcome a new organist this morning. Beginning to think I might have said something. (laughs) Anyway, let's have a quick run through the main notices for this week. Um, Tea and coffee, as I said, afterwards through in the Bill MacDonald Hall. Um, And as I said, Pauline is off this week too. So for any pastoral emergencies, I'll do my best to help you. You'll find my contact details in the order of service. There's a congregational retreat which is being planned for Saturday the 1st of June over at Priestfield Church and that's going to run from 10 o'clock until 1 followed by a light lunch and there's lots of really good and interesting things planned that you can dip in and out of there as well Um, and if you're interested in that then Christine De Luca is the contact for this congregation if you want to sign up and Christine is behind me, there she is. Um, or you can find her contact details in the order of service. And finally, this week, the Thursday Club is on at two o'clock in the Bill MacDonald Hall, where Catherine Booth is going to be presenting a talk on some of the recent outings of the Mayfield Milers Walking Club, which look very good indeed. So before we come to worship, I'd like to invite you to make a sign of peace like this if you like, or perhaps shake hands with your neighbours and go ahead and wish them the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all.
Well, let us say together our, the words of our call to worship, which are printed on your order of service. And we say those together now. All who are in need, come. All who are lonely, come. Young and old, come. Hurting or happy, come. Joyful or sad, come. Doubtful or faithful, come. Come to the grace giver, the one who welcomes us home. Well, let's come together now as we pray to God. Let us pray. Loving God, as Sunday comes around again, we are glad of this time to stop and take a break from our daily lives and to spend this time with you, bringing you thanks and praise for the times we have been happy this week but also bringing you our struggles and our pains and our fears and our doubts. 
But all of these things are fine, God, because you know us inside out. You know there are times when we struggle and we are not at our best. Just as you know us when we are at our happiness, happiest. For we are your children, God, and you only ever want the best for us. So we pray, God, that you can bring that happiness out from us today. Just as after the winter, we see the spring once again emerging from the darkness, trees blossoming and plants flowering almost everywhere we look. So quieten our busy minds, hearts and souls, God, for this time, so that we can focus on what it is that you have to say to us in the prayers, songs and in the word. Help us to know that you use these things to speak to us, to reassure us, to help us to understand you better and to know you as the friend who would never abandon us. And that is true, God, even when we turn away from you, when we doubt you are really there, when we do things that are unloving or unkind, when we think bad thoughts or find ourselves in places that make us scared. You never, ever leave us, even then. Help us to know that we can always turn back to you at any time, God, and that you are always there when we need you the most. Because you are to us blesser and healer, shepherd, strength giver, and guider, and all we have to do is ask. So we do that now as we come together as your family on earth, saying together the words of the family prayer taught to us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
first lesson is taken from Acts 4, 32 to 35. The believers share their possessions. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and with great grace upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold they laid at the disciples' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The second reading is from John 20, 19 to 31. Jesus appears to his disciples. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Jesus and Thomas. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The purpose of this book. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. For the word of God revealed through scripture, thanks be to God.
God of all truth, guide our minds by your Spirit, that we may understand your word, learn your will, and follow closely in the steps of Jesus. Amen. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Well, I'm sure most, if not all of us, would recognize those words taken from the Apostles' Creed and occasionally said out loud in many churches, including this one from time to time. But I do wonder a bit just how comfortable you really are with it. Do you believe all of those words? Or do you quietly harbour some doubt? Can you bring yourself to say them out loud, especially if you're not really certain about it? Or are there any parts of it that actually make you feel quite uncomfortable? Well, I imagine there are a range of theological positions on these words in most congregations, including this one. And I would invite you to hold those thoughts in mind as we contemplate our scripture readings. The Gospel of John, as you may know, is one of the newest books in the Bible. It's broadly accepted to have been written down between 90 and 95 AD some 60 years or so after the death of Jesus. In fact, the reading from Acts about the believers in an early Christian community was probably written slightly earlier. It could be argued that the author of John may well have been aware of much of what went into the Gospel of Luke and indeed the book of Acts. Contemporaneous to both those texts, though, was a world still debating the significance of Jesus. The community that gathered around the beloved disciple that we hear much about in the Gospel of John would certainly have seen Jesus as a Davidic Messiah. But they were not the only group that gathered around the beloved disciple. Another faction of the same community may have seen Jesus more in a mosaic frame and were probably fairly critical of the temple-based practices that were dominant in Judaism up until the destruction of the temple in AD 70. And another group still were probably quite anti-Semitic altogether, something I think that we can detect in the wording of the gospel. For example, I don't know about you, but every time I read the lines we heard today, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, I have a tendency to cringe a little bit. But it's good to keep in mind that Jesus and the disciples were indeed Jewish themselves. And our NRSV Bibles that you have on your pews are fairly literal translations, which wouldn't take account of that apparent paradox. If we change the wording to Jewish authorities, I think we can get a better example or understanding of what is meant. So this is indeed where we find the disciples. Well, the disciples, it turns out, minus Thomas. 
afraid in an anonymous house. We don't know where really and behind locked doors. And who can blame them for being afraid? We have heard in the last few weeks the narrative of Jesus' arrest, trial and execution. And that explains some of what they were afraid of. But the authors of the Gospels probably assumed that the readers would have been well acquainted with what crucifixion involved. So they went a bit light on the details. And for us sitting here, that might be a good thing. In the interests of sparing the squeamish, I thought it would be best not to go into too much more detail, other than to say that when the scourging was complete, there was no way that Jesus was going to survive. His earthly body at that point had been destroyed beyond any hope of recovery. If anyone has watched the film The Passion of the Christ with thoughts that that might indeed be a more accurate account, well, even Mel Gibson and his love of gory violence had to get a certificate for his film. If it had been an accurate depiction of events, I very much doubt it would ever have been screened. So enough said, perhaps, maybe for now. But we'll come back to the crucifixion in a bit. So I hope it's clear enough why the disciples were in fear of the Jewish authorities and were positively keeping a low profile. And very clear why the disciples, other than Mary Magdalene, had run away when push came to shove. If the authorities had caught up with them, the same fate would have been inevitable. And if you're thinking that Mary Magdalene must have thought herself safe from that same outcome, then you'd be wrong. The Romans were quite happy to crucify women too, so her bravery in staying with Jesus cannot be understated. Perhaps then this is why Jesus appeared to Mary first. So did the other disciples in our scene today believe her, I wonder, when she came running to them and told them what she had seen? Perhaps not, if the first thing that Jesus goes on to do after appearing to the disciples is to show them his hands and his side. The account tells us that after seeing the marks, the disciples rejoiced. Not before, you notice. So it seems that all of the male disciples had their doubts too, even after Jesus and all he had tried to tell them, and even after seeing all of his miracles. So perhaps it's unfair that Thomas collected this doubting label that we cast upon him. When the crux of the matter is in Jesus' reply to him. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That's us, by the way. But the whole point of the story is reflected in the final sentences. These are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Those words, in fact, pretty much summarize what the Gospel of John is all about. And as I said at the beginning, it was contemporaneous to a world that was still deeply debating who Jesus was. Maybe we still are. So I began the sermon with the words, I believe. And I wonder how the gospel reading makes you feel about what you believe. Does it help to clear any lingering doubts 
you've had in your mind about the resurrection. Or perhaps it doesn't do anything for you at all. After all, a, a few stories and a, a fairly flimsy statement at the end of everything saying, well, we should believe because that's what the point of this book is. Does that cut out these days? But here's the thing, and it's a question I've reminded myself of many times when I'm in that pessimistic mood. And the question is this, what would have happened if Jesus had not appeared to the disciples? Let's go through the gospel scene again and work it through in that particular lens. So we find the disciples not believing that Jesus had been resurrected. The prophecies of the Hebrew Bible and all that Jesus had promised had not been fulfilled. They were hiding, fearing for other lives. And apart from Mary Magdalene, they had all run away at the first sign of trouble. And so, does anyone here think that this would have ended any other way than the disciples splitting up and returning home post haste? I bet those fishing nets looked much more attractive than a miserable death on the cross. And so the conclusion to this line of thought is that, as Sandy suggested last week, Jesus would have been nothing more than a minor prophet at best, and there is no chance at all that the story of Jesus and all that he had to say to us would ever have spread the way it did. And yet here we are today, because the disciples did not go back to their fishing nets, and they did risk crucifixion to go forth and tell the stories of what they had seen and what they had experienced. And it did cost some of them their lives, but they still did it. They must have, must have believed it was worth it. It was too important. They had seen enough to be utterly convinced that Jesus was the Son of God and they had to do anything they could to spread that message as far and as wide as they possibly could. And that is why in our other reading from Acts, which you will remember is slightly earlier than when this is written down, we hear of a group of believers in the early church giving all of their possessions, all of their land and their homes to be sold or held in common between them. It is here that we find an expression of complete faith and trust of a type that we would today, I think, if we're honest with ourselves, really struggle with. We read that they believed the testimony of the apostles as to Jesus' resurrection, and that was the key to it all for them. They were convinced, probably not just by that alone, but by whatever else the apostles had told them about. So whatever happened in that house, behind locked doors, when the disciples were gathered together fearing for their lives, was enough to change history. Whatever form Jesus had appeared to them in dispelled their doubts. Of course, we might debate the exact details from our point in history 2,000 years down the line, and that's fine too. Maybe the fine details are just a matter of preference or whatever makes the most sense to you. Because all of these paths end up in pretty much exactly the same place anyway. And hopefully, hopefully it is here. I believe in Jesus Christ. On the third day he rose again. 
He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. And now to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be glory and praise now and forever. Amen. Don't worry, that was the end. <laughs> Let's join together now as we pray for others. Let us pray. God of all, we give thanks for the life of Jesus and for all of the disciples who risked their lives to bring your gospel of love and peace to the world. And from that gospel flows your love and grace to all creation in which we can find dignity, unity, and life. But many in our world choose to close their hearts to you, God, and the things that you have taught us. Others suffer badly and sometimes for no apparent reason. And these are all things that sadden you as much as they sadden us. So we bring before you our prayers for others today. We pray for the people and places in this world trapped in war, division and conflict. We pray especially for the people of Ukraine and Palestine who have suffered so much in recent months. We pray also for the people of Russia and Israel, especially the many who risk their lives by speaking out, challenging and standing up to evil. We pray for peace, God, in places where the sound of laughter has given way to explosions, where evil preys on the innocent, and where those who place their hope in hatred try to put out your light. 
We pray for the places, God, where poverty is rife, for people the world over who struggle to have enough to eat or drink. We pray for hungry children and for anyone who finds school holidays a curse rather than a blessing. We pray for creation, God, as the climate keeps changing for the worst. As ice melts and water levels rise, as species become ex extinct, as land is lost to the sea and storms disrupt precious food supplies. We pray for the strength to make whatever changes we can now and before it is too late. And we pray for those who have lost everything already. And we pray for the generations that will come after us and will have to live with the mistakes that we make today. And we pray, God, for the people that we know and love, or even those who we just know of, we think especially of those we worry about in any way. Those who have any form of need, great or small. In a short moment of silence, we think of them now and we pray that you would hear those names and know what it is that we are asking you for. We pray, God, for the peace which disturbs as much as it comforts, the peace that makes us look beyond our own pain and suffering. And may that peace and love fill this world once again, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.
We close now by saying together the words of the closing responses which are printed on your order of service. In the times we are skeptical, God give us faith. In the times that we question, God lead us to answers. In the times we believe, although we cannot see, help us to remember that we are blessed. So go in peace with faith in your hearts and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.